Hi, this is Chris Campbell, and welcome to the Food Institute podcast. Food Institute CEO Brian Choi is with us, and today we will be speaking with Andy and Tom Gellert of the Gellert Group of Companies in the second installment of our leadership series. Today we'll be exploring how one of the world's largest food companies is leading amid the coronavirus pandemic and associated supply chain issues stemming from it. But first, whether you are a first-time listener or becoming something of a regular, we ask that you share this episode on your social media platforms. It really helps us to expand our reach, and we really appreciate it when you do so. So with that said, I'll start off by asking the Gellert brothers how they're doing today. So how are you guys? Pretty good so far. Thank you. Doing okay. Thank you very much. Glad to hear it. So I'd like to start off with a little discussion regarding the pandemic. And Andy, as one of the largest privately held food importers in the U.S., you likely have a better view than most when it comes to the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic and the effect it's had on world markets. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about some of the food commodity markets that are thriving and some that are facing difficulty due to the public health crisis. Great. I mean, I'd say the biggest difficulty is definitely the food service sector. So, you know, all the travel, hotels, sporting events, and I think where we're thriving is a lot of in our retail and manufacturing business, especially a lot of canned products, canned meats, canned fruits and vegetables, as well as some frozen items. Yeah, and just to add to what my brother said, you know, travel, Aramark recently reported that, you know, they're down 45%. So, you know, all these, all these banquets, all these events, uh, you know, business travel, uh, hotels are down. Cruise lines, obviously, an important sector. So, um, but people are eating in other areas. QSR and, and sort of pizza chains have, have picked up um, some of that share of, of food service. So, Tom, I heard your brother talking there about canned and frozen items. So, I was wondering if there's any specific product types in those categories that are experiencing dramatically increased demand, and are you finding any difficulty in sourcing some of those products from around the world? Um, you know, one item that's Maybe surprising is, is all canned goods, but you know canned meats, which has been traditionally a mature declining category, has seen a resurgence, particularly at value uh, retailers and dollar stores. Um, sourcing has not been an issue for us uh, on any canned goods or, or frozen items uh, geared towards geared towards retail. Uh, you know we've been sourcing products. We have long time relationships with many of our vendors, and even though we've seen a surge of buying, particularly in April and May. Uh, those uh, those long-term relationships uh, and our ability to hold inventory have helped us uh, service our customers. Not saying it's not easy, uh, but it's um, you know I think we're you know we're we're good at importing and and we've been able to execute and satisfy our customers do the during this uncertain demand. And I, I just like to add that you know our our great relationships with our suppliers. You know, look, Europe was hit first with this virus. We really didn't lose a beat, and we've been uh, communicating all the time with our suppliers. We have weekly supplier updates and it's just been a, a great partnership with our suppliers around the world, making sure that we're getting the goods that we need in our supply in our supply team. So, And Andy, I heard you and Tom speaking a little bit earlier, you know, it's a common theme in the food industry right now that we're seeing a dichotomy between retail and food service. So I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of an insight into the food service and retail aspects of your business and how they're faring in the wake of the pandemic. I mean, I look at the Geller Global Group, and we're so proud and honored that we're such a diverse company. We, we sell manufacturers, retailers, and food service. So even though our food service is hurting, uh, we're, we're pivoting well, and our retail is doing great. Our manufacturing is doing well. And in our food service, we're really going after the QSRs and the restaurant train, trying to find innovative items that make uh, the restaurants have less touches in the, in the, in the restaurant labor saving opportunities, going after convenience stores. So we're really trying to be as creative as possible, even though that we're losing business with the cruise and the travel business. Yeah, and he pretty much covered it well. I mean, food service overall is down, you know, 20, 20 plus percent worse at the high end, but, you know, retail, uh, particularly Center Store and Frozen have, have, um, have uh, certainly made up for that. And Tom, you were also speaking with your brother there earlier about how you have this uh, global supply chain and you have all of these partners around the world and how proud you are to have that kind of reach. And I was just wondering, other than these weekly supply meetings and talking to these distributors, what other uh, actions are you taking to manage the supply chain? And what adjustments have you had to make since the, the pandemic started hitting all of these other countries and then the U.S.? Well, it's certainly not easy because of uh, the uncertainty. Uh, you know, when when it started hitting other parts of the world, obviously we're concerned about our our partners' ability to ship to us. And the challenge, of course, is forecasting demand, 
when food service fell off uh, late March, early April, and then started to climb back in, in uh, May and June, what's, what's the real demand? And the retail business, which took off, uh, you know, in April and May, uh, off its peaks, but still at a higher clip uh, than historicals, you know, you want, to, you want to be able to service your customers. You don't want to run out of stock. You know, being an importer, it makes a quite long lead time to make sure that we have product from around the world in our warehouses across the country to serve our, our customers. So it's, it's not easy besides communication. I mean, we're kicking the tires on the analytics, on the forecasting uh, every day and trying to communicate with our customers. You know, it's part science, part art, but uh, it's really all hands on deck to make sure that we're able to, uh, to execute. I'd just like to add that, you know, hats off to our, our sales team because we've done a great job where we have excess inventory on the food service items and we try to be imaginative and find homes either in manufacturing or commissaries that, that you know, for the, for the grocery chains. We're really trying to take lemon and make lemonades wherever possible. Right. That sounds, that sounds amazing, you know, and, and, you know, it's a, you know, one of the follow up questions I have is related to the, you know, to COVID-19, you know, looking back, you know, at the, the, the history of, you know, the Gallup group of companies is the, is this COVID pandemic, you know, the worst sort of quote crises that, um, that you guys have, have faced in the past or, you know, uh, where does it lie in the context of some of the other, you know, um, you know, other kind of business interruptions that, that you guys have experienced as a, um, you know, as a large food importer? Brian, that's a good question because just this week, you know, we were prepared for a big tropical storm and it reminded us all of what happened at Sandy. Sandy came, we had about $15 million worth of damage and it was, tra- you know, catastrophic. We had 27 doors in our warehouse blow off. We had product gone and just the amount of love and dedication from our team. Everyone was here sweeping up and cleaning and how we came together. You know, sometimes you learn if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. So Sandy, you know, we, we, we survived and got through this. This COVID's a lot longer and it's been going longer, but we have the same emotion and same uh, great teamwork with the organization. So listen, change is happening and we're embracing change. And we're hopeful we're going to be through this as stronger than ever. So, yeah, obviously the unique challenge with this situation is you know everybody uh, is impacted, not just you know our day to day execution at work, but people are are impacted in personal ways, uh, whether illness is struck in individuals or their family or their ability to see family, and 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 everyone's lives have been disruptive in numerous ways, but. We're all in this together, and we try to at least uh, with our you know our, our family at work and our work family try to continue to communicate and, and build each other up because uh, you know we're all in this together. We know it will get better, uh, and uh, we just have to be strong, uh, you know, and, and be there for each other until until we're through the other side. All right. So next, I'd like to move into some business operational questions for you guys. Uh, so given that we've seen the economy and the psyche of consumers with many businesses hoping for the best, but planning for the worst and consumers also doing the same, I was wondering, Andy, how has the Geller group of companies been able to adjust to this new norm from a risk and cost management? Uh, you know, early on, we, we sat down with senior leadership and we reforecast what the end of the year would look like. And we were trying to manage that. I mean, it's just been, you know, I don't think in March when this happened, we'd, we'd, we'd think we'd still be here today. But we're, we're getting through this. And, we're, we're, you know, the, the, the senior leadership and the whole organization has done a great job of communicating and sitting around a table and, and, and working out new plans. And if plans don't work, we try something else. So it's really been a very, uh, you know, entrepreneurial spirit here that, that I'm very happy what's going on. I think two of the big business risks in our business uh, center around, um, you know, customer accounts receivable risk uh, and, and inventory when you're requiring inventory. And again, it's been all hands on deck. We've been working with our, our good customers, the ones that need to help uh, to to support them through these troubled times in the food service side. And then we've seen great appreciation from those those good customers um, as we've helped them navigate. Uh, but we continue to monitor. Uh, you know that exposure uh, very tightly, and uh, as my brother alluded earlier, you know when the when the business sort of dropped off on the food service side uh, in March and April, uh, and you know restaurants are looking at s- scaling down menus, 
you know, leaves us in inventory position. So we're, you know, working hard to find creative avenues and mitigate, uh, you know, some of those downsides as well. So, Tom, I have a question regarding your workforce. Uh, are your employees working from home? And if so, what is your long-term view on working from home? Is it a model that's going to remain after the pandemic, or is it going to be a hybrid model where you have employees uh, sharing time between home and at the workplace while they're uh, actually doing their work? Very quickly, uh, our workforce adapted to working from home. Uh, really, hats off to our IT team for helping enable that make happen. And uh, the group has functioned uh, at a very high level uh, probably ex- clearly exceeded all expectations, the ability of output. Again, people stressed at home, working families, probably with kids trying to do school at home too. So, but it's, it's worked out, uh, very well. Uh, you know, fewer offices. My brother's been in, in the office every day, have, you know, a half a dozen, dozen people in there, uh, uh, daily, obviously our, our, all our warehouses and, and our, our cheese conversion facility, require people be there every day and those people have been true heroes by showing up every day but certainly in the office you know i think we view it there will be some sort of hybrid model we've sort of proven that you know people could be uh very productive and efficient uh, working from home with fewer distractions less of a commute uh but you know, certainly miss that interaction uh, amongst your team and and you miss that um you know you miss that uh sort of uh, group camaraderie so there's there's going to be some hybrid. Uh, the pendulum is not going to shift from one extreme to another. It's going to, you know, go back and forth, and we'll find that the right spot. I almost look this as an opportunity. As my brother said, we'll probably never be back at full strength as we used to be. But you know, if we're at a 50% level, we can actually hire more people to have, because uh, we're pretty tapped out here on our headquarters. So. You know, things are going to change going forward, and I think we're embracing the change. So um, we're, we're, as my brother said, the team's done tremendous, well, tremendously well working from home, thanks to Zoom and Microsoft Teams and the IT team. We've really done, a, 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 I think, an excellent job in communicating, making sure our vision and values are out there and I'm moving forward. Oh, that's great. You know, you know, one of the, just a follow up question related to that is, you know, um, you know, here at the Food Institute, we've had to adjust like, you know, uh, just like any other company. Right. And so, you know, coming in from, you know, we have an office in, in New Jersey and I'm, I personally like the, the, you know, the day to day, the camaraderie with the other, um, you know, with the other employees and having to, to shift like overnight into this whole online and zoom and, and microsoft teams has, has been an adjustment but what's what's amazing and you mentioned this as well is that you 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 see the resilience of your team right and and being able to adapt to um you know new situations and you know i'm sitting here as you know running this business and and you know, with Chris and the rest of the team, that I, I feel like they're more more uh, effective <laughs> working remotely, and that was something that was a surprise to me. So, I definitely um, see where you're coming from um, on the whole kind of you know uh, being able to pivot and, and adjust. So, you know, uh, it it seems like you have a good uh, good team uh, over there um, that uh, that are supporting you guys. So, uh, that sounds great. Um, so, you know, moving into to a different sort of category on leadership, you know, and management questions, um, you know, the your businesses have been have been kind of multi generational, right? And so, um, having worked in the business for for many years uh, over decades, you know, do you think it makes it more difficult to run, you know, as a family owned b- business versus versus um, you know uh, a non family? Uh, business. I just wanted to get your perspective on this. I mean, I think there's pluses and minuses, but you know, I wouldn't change this for the world. Uh, I'm so lucky that Tom and I get along so well. We have different point of views, but you know, we, we look at things at, at differently, and that that gives a better perspective to when we look at uh, situations. And I also think, at being a family business, we have empathy for our team, and we really, you know, we really get to try to get to know as many people as possible, and. It's like a family spirit here. So, um, you know, there's always pluses and minuses to a family business, but um, I definitely see it on, on the plus side. I wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with my brother. Um, the um, I had a brief career in finance, and I used to say, well, there's there was nights where I had to work all night, so I didn't sleep. But now I say I can't sleep, but that's not just because I'm concerned about the future. It's really because I also 
you, you think of these opportunities and, and you get kind of wired thinking about them and uh, sort of the ups and downs gets you motivated. As my brother said, I think family business brings you that empathy that's needed to, to help uh, lead the organization and uh, really connect with you know our employees and, and hear their stories and understand about them. And, uh, um, you know, we're not here. This, you know, this year's a struggle. Uh, we, our grandfather started this business 75 years ago, so we're we're not going anywhere. There's going to be ups and downs, and we are able to take a real long view on you know where this is going. So we're not, um, you know, it's, if it's going to be a fight, a real struggle for a year, 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 then you know that's okay. A year out of 75, uh, you know, is small, and we could be here a lot longer. Yeah, it's not too bad. You know, one one out of seventy five. So, um, and you mentioned some of the the opportunities, and so you know, wanted to touch upon that and delve deeper into it. You know, as you kind of look at the the Geller group of companies over the next, let's say, three to five years, um, can you identify maybe the top three kind of future growth areas that you guys are focused on, um, and uh, and how you how you see those v- growth areas impacting the business and the way people eat? Well, I think. Um, we can increase our share. Uh, having some size and scale in the import business, this crisis will shake some of that out. Uh, our ability that we've had to service our customers during this time period, I think, has deepened our partnerships uh, with uh, our customers. Uh, any suppliers that have felt that they could go direct without importers, I think, recognize the value of an importer. So I think a big, our biggest opportunity for us to grow is just simply grow our sort of share amongst our existing customers uh, today. Um, you know, our vision is to be part of every food experience. Some of those food experiences are changing as people are going from, you know, instead of going to a restaurant, maybe picking up and we might have to adapt our product line and we have been uh, to provide more grab and go items. Uh, target channels like C-stores, we'll, that'll see an increase. So yeah, I think that family business mentality allows us to pivot very quickly. Um, and uh, I think our size and scale will benefit us uh, in terms of grabbing share. And I'd also like to add, listen, we're always looking at other opportunities in terms of acquisitions, uh, even though you know private equity is very, uh, um, very big in this space, but some people who want to be part of a family business and, and take some money off the table, we've done some great partnerships. So I, I see uh, more opportunities in some acquisitions. And you know, as Tom says, get more share in what we do uh, today, but also look at other acquisitions down the road and, and continue continue this great tradition. Yeah, uh, I'd love to, to touch more upon that. On You know, you mentioned acquisitions. So what's the ideal type of company you're looking for? So in, in terms of size, in terms of sector, in, in terms of niche within the food and beverage industry, can you share a little bit about what, what sort of target company you're, you're looking for? I'd say it's really all, you know, we try to keep things within our wheelhouse. We don't want to, you know, get into heavy manufacturing. We, you know, we, we like to stay in the import side, but there could be opportunities in the export business and covering other channels we're not really covering. And we're, we're, we're always looking, we're always inquisitive. And I think it makes us, it, it keeps us fresh to know what's going on in the industry and, and look at other opportunities. And being diverse in terms of our current product portfolio and our channels that we that we target across North America, a lot of our competitors are in a narrower range of whether product portfolio or channels. So, you know, when there's an exit from one of these small to medium sized companies, maybe someone's retiring and their next generation is not going to the business. I think we offer a great opportunity for them to sort of you know exit. Uh, gracefully, in the, you know, uh, while still remaining in the industry, uh, allowing them to to connect with the family business and allowing us to really seamlessly uh, latch on one of these you know mid-sized food importing businesses you know anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Right. Yeah. So M and A is something where I've I spent a lot of years you know working in investment banking and then prior to coming on board Food Institute, I, I worked for a private equity firm uh, focused on food you know food and beverage. So. Um, it's definitely something near and dear to my heart, and I definitely understand the mentality of um, of acquiring businesses that um, fit within the whole family culture. And, and I think what you guys have um, it, it's something that's ideal for many companies that you know uh, where the owner and founders you know they're they're you know aging, and but they also want to take some chips off the table and potentially retire. So I think it's an ideal setup. So. Um, 
So that's great. Um, my last couple of questions kind of, were, you know, wanted to get your perspective on what makes an effective leader, right? So, you know, leadership is a topic that, you know, the the guys at Harvard and all the Ivy League, they talk about, they write about. Um, many of them only talk about it from a theoretical perspective. You guys have lived it, you know, in, in different in, in different capacities. Um, and so, you know, uh, if you, if each of you can kind of share kind of what, what's, what makes an effective leader, um, you know, as a food and beverage industry, um, um, or company, like what, 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 what traits do you, does a leader need to have in this current time? Uh, I, I, sorry about that. Uh, listen, I think empathy, number one, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, clarity, communication, uh, it's just, uh, you know, understanding that you can't do it alone. You need a lot of help and, uh, you know, team spirit. I mean, I, I, there's so many things to becoming a, g- a good leader that, uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, as an organization, we have a lot of good leaders and, we, you know, it, it's been, it, you know, Tom, you want to add anything else? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I don't necessarily view us as experts, but what we try to do is, one, create a lot of trust uh, in our team, particularly with senior leadership, but really trust in everybody. And I think that's that's helped us on the execution of this dramatic shift to work from home is because we have a lot of trust uh, in our employees. Uh, you know, really lead by example. I mean, growing up in a family business, I think people have seen, um, you know, seen my brother and myself and, and, and everybody in this generation do, you know, do some of the dirty work that needs to get done. And we're not above that, and I think um, I, I, I think I, I, that resonates. Uh, you know, my brother talked about empathy and really just listening uh, to to your employees. I mean, uh, their understanding that one, their health and, and safety, uh, you know, and of them, their family is number one. And you know, everyone's going through unique challenges at this time, and just being being aware of that, and accepting that, and, and be just being there as a voice and, and listening to them. I think um, I think that bodes well. And, uh, helps that trust be reciprocal uh, uh, between employees and yourself. Right. Thanks for that. Um, and as a final question, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of executives in the food and beverage industry they they, they look up to you, you know, and and the Geller family, you know, as 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 leaders. And and so, what are some you know final thoughts that you know you you'd like to share with the the food industry community and. Um, you know, whether it's about leadership or whether it's just, you know, just general thoughts where, where things are going. Um, you know, if you can share, you know, a, a final thought, that would be that would be great. You know, I think we're fortunate to be in such a, you know, a dynamic industry, an industry that we're passionate about. I mean, we love food, number one. And it's certainly it's it's heartbreaking to see you know, people who've been in the industry, you know, really put their heart and soul in something or whether it's a restaurant owner or a chef or somebody who's really just struggling um, and, and not going to make it because they 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 sort of follow their dream, and so it's it's certainly a struggle to see that. But I think it's a it's a it's a great community, the industry, and you know we're here for each other. I mean, yes, we have we have competitors, uh, but um, I think we're able to maintain professional relationships across the organ across the industry, um, build great partnerships with our customers, business suppliers, and just remember we're. We're all in this together as, as, as one sort of global community and we're, we should be here for each other. I mean, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I, I think it's great how we have such great relationships with our suppliers, with our customers, and with our employees. It's just uh, we're all on the same page. And as Tom says, even our competitors, when, when, when this first hit, I, you know, we reached out to some of our competitors and saying, listen, you know, good luck. Hope, hope you get through this. And the end of the day you know people got to eat and there's got to be people like us to support them and uh you know like i said it's all it's all about being partners with your employees your suppliers and your customers all right so i think that about wraps it up for us on this episode of the food institute podcast andy and tom i'd just like to ask where can our listeners go to learn more about you guys and also your uh, portfolio of companies i mean the best i guess to really get understanding of the whole organization is to go to uh, gellerglobalgroup.com and you'll find links to our uh, individual companies Atlanta, American, J.F. Brown, uh, Finica Foods, etc. Uh, I guess that's a good launching part, l- launching uh, pad or uh, follow Atlanta on LinkedIn and see a lot of updates as well. So, Yeah, definitely. Thank you guys. I really appreciate the opportunity. 
uh, we want to thank you guys again. Uh, we'll definitely share the relevant links as well in the description of this video. So on behalf of Brian and myself, once again, I'd like to thank you for your time today. And remember, if you're new to the Food Institute podcast, please follow, like, and share. If you'd like to learn more about the Food Institute, please take a look at the links in our description to learn more about us and what membership could do for you and your company. So until next time, this is Chris Campbell signing off.